Longworth, and welcome to another edition of Try It Today, coming to you from the uh, Senior Botanical Garden in uh, Kernersville. Beautiful place. We'll tell you more about them later on. And later on is when the roundtable will show up, and we'll get into all sorts of controversies, so stay tuned for that. But between now and then, some great guests, important information coming your way, including a discussion about why it's so important for us to volunteer. But where we want to start is talking about, well, folks my age. Uh, I'm way up there, and we want to talk about an age-friendly organization, Age Friendly for Sight. I'm going to find out all about it with these two very special guests. On my immediate right, Teresa hoffman makar She's Director of Age Friendly for Sight, which I just uh, mentioned. And Loretta Bell is uh, Travel and Meetings Coordinator for the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, who uh, brought us this topic today. And also, Loretta is a member of the leadership team for Age Friendly for Sight. Welcome, ladies. Good to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Loretta, I'm going to start with you. For folks who might have just moved into the area or don't know, um, what uh, sort of sum up what the mission of uh, Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation is? Sure. The mission of Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation is to improve the quality of life for all North Carolinians. And uh, when I mentioned in the in the opening that you're on the leadership team uh, for that in Teresa's uh, leadership team, what I mean, what's the connection there? I mean, why that connection? Yeah. So Z. Smith Reynolds is a community partner with Age Friendly Forsyth. And as a member of the leadership team, we serve as the uh, spokespeople and we also serve as champions for the organization. And we also help, the main, help maintain the structure of the organization. Well, now we're going to find out about that organization. So now we're going to turn to you, Teresa. What is the mission of Age Friendly for Sight? Tell us about it. Of course. So Age Friendly for Sight is a community alliance that engages and informs aging adults and community partners to create a livable community through strategic collaborative planning. And we have the vision that aging adults in Forsyth County are living their best lives. Now, tell me about some of the uh, initiatives that uh, you have that are underway, maybe some that you've already uh, put together and that are underway now. Talk about them. Of course. So recently, um, Forsyth County, North Carolina, actually um, just uh, recertified um, their membership with the National AARP Network of Age-Friendly Communities. So that's a huge success um, for Forsyth County, and it really shows that we are committed to um, helping to support the, the aging population. Uh, for right now, we are working on developing common uh, community goals and objectives that will help inform a more comprehensive aging plan. Now, what, how does that, give me a specific on how that would help somebody my age. I'm, you know, my late 60s and, you know, I find out about your organization. What is it, how can you help me directly? Or you're talking about community partnerships. How am I benefiting from some of the things that you're working on with the support of folks like uh, Loretta? Sure, of course. So um, with, with, our, with our leadership team, we actually are creating um, a, a strong partnership from a wide variety of organizations that are in our community, along with community members and residents who have that lived um, experience in the county. And so hand in hand, um, these two are coming together to really work together to develop common goals, which ultimately are going to impact the daily lives of the aging adult in Forsyth County. Now, why is the uh, support of Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation so important? I know Loretta's on your leadership uh, team, and that's important too. But uh, why, why is it in general the, their support? What does that mean to your agency? It's huge. It means that they have a stake in, in, in aging in the county. Age Friendly for Scythe is a self-funded community initiative, which means that all of our leadership team organizations are contributing funding to help sustain our activities. So it, it's, it's just, it's a huge statement that's saying we support aging and age-friendly processes. Yeah, Loretta, let me put you on the spot, you know, being a member of the leadership team. And I know you've had an interest in healthcare things uh, going back in your career too. Uh, why do you like being involved with that? Um, because uh, uh, many people in the community are not aware of uh, the huge senior population that we have in the city and in the Forsyth County. And we are helping bring awareness of that so that we can create a collaborative planning and a process that uh, everybody thrives in this community. Knowing that, that I have an advocate like, like you and, and Teresa, and let me put you on the spot too, Teresa, in the few seconds we have remaining. Why do you like doing what you're doing? I just, I've, I've always had a passion for helping the aging population. I think that when you, you, you work in a community, when you live your life in the community, when you've, you've been supportive of a community, of a community all your life, you, you just deserve to, to be able to age, um, just with dignity. Yeah. And, um, I, I just, 
I don't know. I just have always wanted to help the aging adults. No, that's fine. I appreciate what both of you are doing. Up on screen, I, I don't want to run out of time on this. Agefriendlyforsight.org is the website. Please check that out. Agefriendlyforsight.org. And again, thanks to Mo Green and everybody at Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation for suggesting this topic. That uh, website is zsr.org, zsr.org for the foundation. We'll be right back. I know on Try It Today, and I bet that just about all of us here, those of you watching at home, have volunteered for something at one point in your life, and good for you. Well, let's talk about volunteering with two very special people who know all about it. On my immediate right, Tina Beasley is Manager of Volunteer Services at Northern Regional Hospital based in Mount Airy, and welcome to you. Thank you. And you brought along a special guest of your own, and he's sort of socially distanced and seated behind us, Randy McCraw is a volunteer at Northern Region. How you doing, man? Very good, thank you. Thanks for coming down. Thank you. Tina, I want to start with you. Why are volunteers so important to the hospital mission? They are important in so many ways. Uh, our hospital's mission is to provide access to quality and affordable health care, and the volunteers bring that quality in a big way. Um, they really focus on the customer service piece, um, make the, the patients, the visitors feel comfortable, feel at ease, um, offer them that Friendly smile. Um, yeah. well, Randy made me door. feel, yeah. you know, uh, pretty good, and he just walked in. That's, that's right. Probably, now, now, seriously, what kind of duties? You don't have to go into every one, but give me a few examples of of things that, that I can volunteer for if I want to volunteer at, at Northern Regional. Yeah, there are th several things, um, as, as simple as delivering flowers and things like that, but they also do patient transports. Uh, they do discharges when patients are discharged from the hospital. We have volunteers that work in the gift shop, um, in the surgery waiting area. So there's a variety of, of tasks. That so you'll, you'll meet with a volunteer or a potential volunteer that sort of tell you what their interests are and then you sort of match them up to what, what they want to do. Yes. Randy, I think you told me before we started taping, you've been volunteering for what, just over a year? Or? Yeah, about a year and a half. Why did you want to volunteer? Well, my mother worked at Northern Regional for a lot of years, and she had always told me over the years what the volunteers did there. And I kind of had an interest to do that, so after I retired, I decided I would try it out. Well, now, what kind of, uh, I'll put you on the spot now, what kind of duties do you do as a volunteer? What kind of things do you do at, at the hospital? Well, most of what I do is uh, patient transport, uh, people who come in who are not familiar with the facility, they need help to get where they're going. Uh, also, some people need access with, an, uh, with a wheelchair, and right. I help with that. Uh, then on Wednesdays, I actually work with day, in day surgery, and uh, I help assist families who are there with their, with their member who right, is there right. for surgery. And, yeah, because, you know, hospitals sometimes can, can be confusing if you're not used to where everything's laid out. So you're right there at front to help everybody. Uh, now, what, what do you enjoy most about uh, being a volunteer, other than the fact that you get to say hey, you know, to, uh, to Tina? Well, that's always good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's just a blessing to be able to do something for somebody that they can't do for themselves anymore. So I, I think that's the main thing is being helpful with people who who are nervous to be there in the first place and maybe they can't get around like they used to and right. they need a little extra help and yeah. we're, we're there to do that. Now, uh, I'm assuming, and because I could be wrong, but let me, I'm assuming, Tina, that you still need volunteers. I mean, I know that you have a lot of great volunteers. Do you always look for more? Always. Um, we're always open to add more volunteers. Um, we expand on um, the different areas as we bring more volunteers in. So um, we're always looking at additional ways that the volunteers can help. So Right, so you can sort of adjust the volume of what you're doing. If you've yes. got more you know, outpatient surgery stuff one month and then something else and you can right. do that. Yeah, yes. Randy, let me end up with you. And, and you've sort of already answered this, so I'm, I might be asking you to repeat yourself. But if, if somebody just saw you on TV or saw you on the street and said, well, Randy, I'm thinking about volunteering, but uh, I don't know, what should, should I? Well, you know, everybody's good at something, and whatever you're, you're good at, they can use it. Uh, and you can, you can volunteer 20 hours a week or 20 hours a month, and, uh, and you, you will have a use there. You'll very quickly learn where you can be used best, and uh, Tina will use you. Yeah, well, I just think it's great. I love what y'all are doing. I want to put this up on screen. The website is choosenorthern.org. Choosenorthern.org, which gives you a lot of great information about the hospital and all the fine folks there. But I just applaud what the two of you do. And Randy, for being a volunteer, thanks, man. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right.
We'll be right back today. And this is what I'm going to call our international segment because we have two lovely ladies, both of us, both of them hailing originally from different countries on my immediate right. Tiffany Magna, assistant professor of business who uh, hails originally from France, and we welcome you to the show. And Alma Grachich, who's assistant professor of business at the Business School at Carolina University, coming to us from Bosnia-Herzegovina. Welcome. Thank you, Jim. I'm going to ask you both the same question just to start out. You don't have to take very long on this, just briefly, uh, about your background and what, what brought you to Carolina University. So I'm born and raised in France, as you said. I moved to the U.S. eight years ago for my master um, in, at the University of Delaware and graduated last year from a PhD in economics. So I came to the University, um, Carolina University, because I really share the same vision of providing affordable higher education. I also really like the focus on diversity and the growth mindset of the leadership. So the school is investing in new programs, new courses, and new recruits. Yeah, well, that sounds like a good commercial for the, for the university then. <laughs> what, what, about, what about you, Alan? I moved to the United States in 2009 to pursue my bachelor's. I graduated with a PhD in economics from the University of Miami last summer, and then I joined Carolina University. Well, in addition to what Tiffany has already mentioned, I would like to highlight the fact that uh, we as faculty have a wide range of, of opportunities to create new and relevant courses for our students, and also we actively participate in program development. Also, our faculty and staff believes wholeheartedly in Carolina University mission to move the boundaries and create affordable education and high quality education, but uh, at the affordable price. Right. Uh, now, uh, Tiffany, let me ask you about what, what kind of degree programs does the School of Business offer now? Sure. So we have the BBA, the Bachelor of Business Administration. So that provides students with uh, understanding of business disciplines such as management, leadership, marketing, um, international business, and, and what, finance. What are the benefits of these programs to the to the and degree programs to the students? What do they get from it? Sure, they get uh, first. We are our programs are student oriented, so uh, we offer um, great flexibility in our programs. All of our courses can be taken in person or online, either synchronously or asynchronously, but the students also really uh, gain valuable professional skills, business writing skills, oral presentation skills, teamwork, and um, leadership skills. Yeah, Alma, it seems like that, uh, I'm wondering how the shift in technology is, is changing the way that, that Carolina U University and higher education in general is adapting to that. Any thought about that? Yes, for sure. Well, businesses have been changing and they have been disrupted in recent years, mostly by technological changes. Technology has changed the way we work and uh, the biggest concern is in the labor force displacement. So business schools have a huge responsibility. They need to shift the way they think and organize their programs. They need to create the programs that move beyond the theory and into the practice and mimic the world in a sense that are gonna give the students the skill set to, um, to, to get the, like to be able to fight the challenges of a data-driven world right. and at our school at the patterson school of business we think about these challenges first we pride ourselves for our online course delivery and also like we have in addition to blended learning we also implement the experiential learning and thirdly i would mention that uh, we we use the interdisciplinary course creation and delivery. For example, in our MBA program, we have a specialization in business analytics. Through this program, our students, they take classes in both in business and in data science. And as we know, like there is a huge surge in, in uh, jobs that requires both like business analytics skills as well as, uh, as well as uh, managerial and leadership skills. Right, and all those, of course, factor into getting the students prepared to work in and manage in the global economy. And I just appreciate what the two of you are doing, and there's so much more we could talk about, but time's about to run out, so I want to make sure I put this up on screen. CarolinaU.edu is the website. CarolinaU.edu, which we hope you will check out. And I can't think of two finer representatives of what how unique the university is, and to have you two ladies here and, and doing what you're doing for so many students. I appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank you so much.
We'll be right back. And, uh, try today, time to talk to Mr. Theater. He's right here, Dave Briggs, director of the High Point Theater. Good to have you back, sir. Great to be back, Jim. And I'm, I'm really glad here in the next, the last couple times you've been here, you've been smiling because things are That's opened late. up. We're filling the, <laughs> filling the theater. People, you know, the mask or, well, people can still wear a mask Absolutely. if they want to. Yeah. But, um, and I guess that's, I mean, but there's no requirement. I don't right. have to wear a mask if I go into High Point Theater. Um, but we want everybody vaccinated and go in there and enjoy the shows. Now, let's talk about two things. You have some really great comedy things coming up, and you have some really great magic things coming we up. We have some great comedy. So magic. I want to start with the magic. Sure. The first one I want to ask about is Andy Gross on Saturday, August 21st. Yeah, Andy is a remarkable, he's not just a, a magician, he's also a comedian. And uh, he's known nationwide. Uh, some of the stuff he will do, be, you know, between you and I, there's, he's got one spot where he basically looks like he takes his body and puts it in half. And I don't know how he does it, but it's, it's amazing. And he's very funny. He loves to work the crowd. He's going to be a great time. Um, that's cool. And that's in August. And, and then, then we have uh, Mike Super on Saturday, September 25th. Yeah, and Mike Super was, uh, he was in the top five on American Idol. I'm sorry, America's Got Talent uh, several years ago. Again, a national talent and, ma and magic, well-known name. He does both the, the large illusions and some of the small hand tricks as well, uh, sleight of hand stuff. So he's really fun. Uh, Mike Super is a little more family friendly, perhaps than than uh, than uh, the, uh, Mr. Gross, but um, Mr. Gross more adult. He's a little more adult. I would say sixteen and up. Yeah, but. Any anybody family wise. So I'm not old enough to really understand. You won't movie. understand a bit of it. All right, the uh, <laughs> and you should you should book yourself into the theater because I, I think of you as a magician. You know, <laughs> Sometimes bringing I do. all these acts. Yeah, thank you. All right, now let's go to the comedy. Sure. Uh, three things I want to ask you about. Killer Bees. That's not that's spelled. I think B E A Z. Right. Killer Bees performs Saturday, August 14th. What is that about? Yeah, Killer Bees is a, a comedian named Truett Beasley, and obviously his parents didn't like him because they named him Truett. Huh. Uh, <laughs> but he's a very funny fellow, very Southern comedian. Um, he's been around for years. He's been a last comic standing and, and several of the other comic events. Uh, he's a lot of fun. Yeah. People are going to enjoy him, and it's clean comedy. Right. And looking ahead, because, you know, it's great to get these season tickets. We'll tell you, give you a phone number and things for that later. But looking ahead to January, James Gregory on Saturday, January 15th. Funniest man in America. James Gregory is one of the ultimate storytellers. Uh, so he can weave a, weave a piece of comedy in there. It's down-home comedy. It's a lot of fun. And then I'll follow that up immediately. In, in February, we have John Reap. John Reap, yeah. uh, Who is from <laughs> Hickory, North Carolina. <laughs> uh, and, and John was actually the winner of Last Comic Standing. and Just a phenomenal comedian and a lot of fun. Now, let's back up a little bit into uh, next month, uh, into July, uh, because our buddy Billy Crash Craddock is coming back. Billy will be here in August. And by the way, happy birthday. Billy turned 82 on the 16th of June. Okay. Really excited to have Billy here. And then we actually officially open our season on July 17th with two young, talented country performers, Tia Goins, who has been on the uh, Grand Ole Opry and I think has four albums to her name. Right. And then Chelsea Sorrell and uh, Runaway Train. And she used to perform with the Chris Lane Band. Folks around here will know that. Right. She was in the top 12 on American Idol. Beautiful voice. She actually sang a song with John Barry a couple of years ago, and I got to tell you, she's a, she's she's lovely to look at. But what an amazing voice! And, and what a once again, what a broad range of, of, of variety of performances: comedy, magic, music, just the whole thing. Before we lose time here, I want to put up uh, a couple of things on screen: highpointtheater.com. Remember this two. T's in there, highpointtheater.com. Check that out for more information. I'll give you all the, and that great website that's now up and running for, it's been running for a few weeks. Uh, but if you want to, the fastest path to getting your season tickets or individual tickets, call the box office at 887 3001. I'm really looking forward to all this. And um, are you going to stick around for the round table? I'll do it. All Thanks. Right, we'll be right back. I'll try today just about time for the round table but a quick shout out to our good friends here at the senior botanical garden check out their website it's on screen and come on out to the garden and book your weddings and receptions and meetings here it's a great place i'll tell you what else is great sitting next to these three guys on my immediate right but always political left oh gilman the great broadcaster and journalist socially distanced behind him we have held over mr magic mr theater dave briggs director of high point theater and keith granberry uh founder 
and CEO of Helping Hands Consultants. Guys, let's get to it. Beginning J July 1, July 1 now, United Healthcare Insurance Company says it will start rejecting claims for non-emergency visits to the emergency room. You okay with that, Ogie? I certainly am not. I'm with United and I'm about to not be with United. If that goes through, I'm done with it. I don't like them anyway, but I'm totally out of it. You know, you never know. I mean, you think you might have something wrong. and I'm I've not had to go to the ER with a non-emergency. When I got something stuck in my eye, I wouldn't have been able to get this thing out of my eye. Dave. Yeah, and what's an emergency to one person may not be an emergency to another. Uh, a lot of insurance companies are charging a premium if you go to the emergency room already. Right. I, yeah, yeah, this bothers me. Key. Yeah, terribly. I mean, I mean, we cannot determine what's an emergency to someone uh, and they make a determination, and who would make that determination? I think that's a terrible idea. The person, I guess, making the determination is somebody who doesn't have an emergency. That's right. Um, the uh, Winston-Salem, that's like when I go in with kidney stones, they say, oh, you can't be hurting that bad. Uh, lady, do you, have you ever had stone? No, no I haven't. Um, the Winston-Salem and South County School Board is considering charging students a $10 fee to cover the cost of wear and tear on the Chromebooks that they take home, and they bring them back at the end of the year. Now, if the parents don't pay the $10 fee, if this goes through, they would have to be responsible for the full co uh, cost of repair or replacement if there's damage done. You okay with uh, charging a $10 fee, Yogi? Yeah, I think so. I don't think that's unreasonable, 10 bucks, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I am. I think it's, it's, it also gives some ownership what to the uh, to the piece of property, they might take a little better care for it. Yeah, Mr. Granberry. Uh, it, it, it depends. I mean, there are many kids who can't even afford their own lunch. So we're asking them to pay $10 when they can't afford their own lunch. I don't agree with that. So there, there needs to be something set a up waiver, for the young. A waiver yeah, or something? absolutely. All right, up, good point. Up until now, if you vote by mail, then your ballot has to be postmarked by election day. That's here in North Carolina. Remember that those mail-in ballots weren't counted for like nine straight days after this past election. But the North Carolina General Assembly is about to change the deadline so that from now on, the ballots must be received by election day, not postmarked. You okay with the new deadline, Ogie? No, it's just another assault on democracy, another voter suppression measure that's happening all over the country in service of Trump's big lie. That's all it is. But I agree with part of what Ogie said, but I don't have a big problem with making sure the ballots are in when they're supposed to be in, Dave. I agree with that. and. and when I was growing up, when I was when I was a young person, you got one day to vote. If you didn't vote on time and you did a, did a, an absentee ballot, it had to be in on the on the postmark on that day. I think that law to stay the same, but I think they need to be able to count them much quicker than they have been. Yeah, nine days is a little long, Keith. Yeah, yeah. Back then, though, the the uh, there was an assault on democracy uh, where where many minorities were were uh, were assaulted so that they wouldn't vote. So it, the, the change is different. But as long as you vote before the election day, it absolutely should count. I don't understand why they're trying to make they're trying to push back the deadline for people to vote. And I think that is so an assault on democracy and it's a suppression of vote and it should be outlawed. So you're OK with the postmark way? It is. Absolutely. Yeah, OK. Earlier this mo uh, month, uh, uh, Laura Trump announced she would not run for Richard Burr's Senate seat. So her father-in-law, Donald, then endorsed Ted Budd for the Republican nomination. Now, the question is, uh, Pat McCrory and Mark Walker are now leading in the initial polls, and Ted's in third, but uh, that's just early polling. Will Trump's endorsement secure uh, and guarantee a victory for Bud in the Republican primary? Ogie. I don't see it, Jim, I, I, but it's a long way from the midterms, and you know, Trump might be in jail by then, who knows? Might be worthless. Dave. Yeah, so, so like Biden. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really think that it's interesting that, that he chose to endorse uh, um, uh, Bud, Bud over, over Mark Walker, although Ted Bud was a very strong pr supporter of, of Trump. I, I think Pat McCrory is probably still the leader on this, but it'll be six years from him being in office. He may not be relevant any longer. Keith. Uh, I think it will make a difference. Uh, especially in the rural community. So it could, it could make a difference, but I don't still see him as the leading candidate. I still see Pat McCrory as the leading candidate for that position. Well, now, uh, one other thing before we leave this topic, uh, Pat McCrory uh, is a very moderate guy, and he got unfairly blamed for HB2, I think. But moderates and unaffiliated voters who might want to vote for him might think, well, that HB2 thing. Are moderates and unaffiliated going to run away from Pat McCrory or support Pat McCrory? They're going to run to Jeff Jackson. That's what they're going to do. But as far as the primary, as far concerned. as Republicans, I don't think he's going to. That that was 
HB2 is a, a fading memory. I don't think they're going to hold that against him. I in the still primary. think he's going to get most of the moderate vote. I in really the primary. Do. Dave. Yeah, I think he was a very good governor, and I think that he will get the majority of the Republican votes. So they're going to position him as a moderate who can win the election. But the HB2 is going to come back up. It, while it's fading, they're going to make sure it comes right back up in commercial. In the general election. Absolutely. All right. The Navy has just named its latest battleship after a town in Australia in honor of the friendship between our two nations. Sounds nice. But are, are you guys okay with naming an American-built battleship after a foreign country just in general, Hoagie? Sure. What's the problem with that? I have no problem at all with that. Because aren't they usually it's after an admiral or general or president? Or a or? state or something like that. That was an unusual call, but I have no problem with that. Australia's a friend. Okay. I think if, if we we're supposed to be the, the world's nation builder, it shouldn't be any problem. All right. Finally, guys, Green Bay Packers running back. We don't do sports a lot on this, but Green Bay Packers running back A.J. Dillon's quadriceps are so large, he has just given them a name. He calls them Quadzilla. <laughs> yeah. Guys, do you have a nickname for any part of your body, Ogie? There you go. <laughs> uh, actually, my wife does. I don't. I don't know. No, no, no. Dave. Back when I played soccer, my right leg was called Thunder. Thunder. <laughs> and I still don't want to know what Ogie's was. All right, Keith, any part of your body have a name? Why, why do you ask these Never questions? Never mind. <laughs> I can see. I've known him long enough. To, I can see in his eyes something was coming. All right, well, that's all the time we have. Oh, except for this. Um, a little two-year-old girl in California has become the newest member of the Mensa Intellectual Society because she has an IQ of 146. Now, at age two, she can read anything. Of course, like all two-year-olds, she has a lot of temper tantrums. Hey, just like me, except for the reading part, said Donald Trump. <laughs> I don't know what that means. All right, for all of us here, we're going to, as soon as we leave here, we're going to find out what Ogie's body part name is. No, we'll we're not. <laughs>